I've just pushed my notes to GitHub and John has not been able to get time to um, merge my work with main. So this is just a local version. Um, the live version is still not updated. So we are going to work with this for now. Um, we are looking at callback on chapter three. And while I was going through callbacks, I realized um, the whole idea behind callbacks is just having functions within functions. So I decided to have a recap. Uh, we have a recap on functions, especially because for me the past two sessions we've had, um, I got lost at some point. Yeah, so the most common ways to define functions are three. The first one is uh, function declaration. The second one is function expression. The third one is arrow function expression. Now, um, for the first one, which is like the most basic way to define the function, it just uses the keyword function, just as in R, but then it's directly followed by the function name. In this case, our function name is add. And then the parameters, which are X and Y, are um, contained within parentheses and then the function body using curly brackets. Yeah. And then, sorry, I'll be making a lot of comparisons between JS and R because for me, that's how I have learned to, like, that's what I've used to understand JS up to this point. So, um, function is the same as we have in R. We have our function, our argument in parentheses, the same as R, and the return function, the same. Uh, the only thing here is that in JS, you end, it's a good practice to end everything with a semicolon. I think I saw that somewhere. And then instead of print, uh, we have console.log. So everywhere we have console.log, think of it as a print function. And this print function will, <coughs> sorry, it will throw the result or it will display the result of this function. So here we are just taking two numbers and adding them. So 100 plus 200 is 300. So that's the first basic way function declaration. The second way that um, I really love is function expression, which to me is now what we know in R, except from this part. If I was to hide this const part, um, in R we give the object name as add is equal to function, blah, blah, blah. It's just the same as in R. So I've loved this a lot because I've related. Again, um, take two numbers and add them. I've tried to stay consistent with this function so that you can see, um, oops, sorry, that you can see the difference between the two. Yeah, then the third one, which is what it has been used a lot in this book, in the JavaScript book that we are going through, is the arrow function, which is a shorthand syntax uh, that was introduced recently. I don't know how it recent because I, I really don't know what ES it is. Um, and here it uses the, what will you call this? Does this have a name? Um, Let's say arrow for now. In the it book, they call the it arrow. fat fat arrow, I think, which is strange. Sorry, they call it what? Uh, fat arrow uh, is what I think I saw in the book. Uh, type it in the chat. I can't I can't get the first the first word. Or oh, fat arrow. No, I won't call it fat arrow. <laughs> I'll just call it arrow for now. So, oh, I know why it's called fat arrow because okay, let's just call it arrow. Um, it uses the arrow symbol. Um, and this arrow symbol separates the parameters, which are this, and the body of the function. Now, const is um, just a way of declaring um, variables. So you can declare variables using var, letter, const. Um, I read the difference is le with let, you can reassign the variable but with const you can't I can't remember that exclamation but anyway we use we are using const a lot so 
The difference, the arrow function, the main thing is that it has, it uses an arrow symbol to separate the parameters, which are this, and the function of the body, which is this. And then again, this has to be given, uh, uh, let's call it variable. In this case, add. So yeah, you can compare it, it's more comparable to this, um, but then instead of us having function x, y, we have x, y, which are our parameters, arrow, then the function start with, um, the body of the function is displayed. Again, console.log add that. So um, now, why have I put this in different methods? Because for me, um, and again, this is what I've learned in the past one week. You can do this, which I find for me, I'd rather have more lines of code that someone who's reviewing my code can understand. What I've noticed with the book is that um, they are very, uh, the others were used to writing everything in one line, which if you really don't know JS, like now me, as much as you know functions in another language like R, you could get very confused. Because for me, it's easier to read this than it is to read this. And it's basically the same thing. It's just that um, instead of bringing this, like instead of writing this in three lines of code, they've just condensed it into one. So that's the only difference. And then method three is now because our function has, or our function is just one line of code, just X plus Y. It's not like take X and do this and do that. Uh, it's just X plus Y. You can do away with return. And the uh, curly bracket and just have X plus Y as it is. So the three methods will work. Um, I again find this easier um, for me. And anyway, everything, whichever method anyone finds important, like works for them, that's fine. Um, but in the book, mostly they are doing a lot of this, which again, I'm finding very uh, confusing. Like it's, it's a lot of cognitive load. Um, so now, uh, uh, um, also, what uh, are called that? And uh, I, I, Shell, if, if I can, uh, sorry to interrupt, yeah. if I can make a quick comment. Uh, it's not only in the book mm -hmm. that prefers the second method that, that you have used. It's also mm -hmm. the most common one used when you are defining callbacks. Okay, okay, okay. Wow, that's even more scary. <laughs> it's like the industry standard right now. Yeah, pretty much. Okay, uh, please type on the chat so that um maybe someone who looks at this chat later can, I don't know, can get that. But I didn't know, but thank you. Okay, so now callbacks. Um, I've, I've really struggled to understand this, but for me, I feel like callbacks are just a way of defining which function is ran before which other one. Like if you have like a function that does three things, uh, do A, do B, do C, um, it's, it's just a function that is passed into another function that can be called um, at a later date. And, uh, like there's something I've learned. Let me see if I can. Uh, VS code. So sorry, I'm going to interchange between our notes and VS code. Um, there's something I've learned today that function declarations are hoisted, um, and here it means that the function. Um, it's moved to the top of its scope and it can be called for it is declared in the code, which I don't think is possible with R. For example, I have this function that is just a function that greets anyone, like it takes the name uh, as input, as an argument, and then displays a message. But here what happens is that we are invoking this function even before we define it. Um, and I think that's that what that 
that is what it means by function declarations are hoisted. Um, and running this, it actually works. But I really don't think it, it works. Are, um, I read an error saying, uh, yeah, uh, the, you can have so many functions, you can write so many functions, but then um, when you put those functions inside a mother function, um, they become callbacks. That's what I get. Um, I stand to be corrected. And uh, again, then call uh, stack is a mechanism for tracking function calls in a program. And um, I feel like I've seen the word call stack somewhere in R. I think when we are developing Shiny app um, and you get an error, I feel like I've ever seen the word call stack somewhere. Um, but in essence, this mechanism for tracking function calls in a program. Um, and like whenever a function is called the code, and then if a function called function, function is added <laughs> to the top of the call stack. And this, this mechanism is really important, especially when you, the, the function throws a bug, uh, you're able to know which particular function in that mother function actually through the bug. Um, and then call stacks are very important now in like, and are very much used in the functions and functions uh, section here. Um, a call stack is important because it determines the order in which functions are executed. As I've mentioned before, I feel like there's a way we write functions. Um, you can write functions that you specified um, in that mother um, function. So I'm going to start here with an example. Some of these examples are borrowed from different areas. I have, so I've been using our book. I've also been using this book, which is called uh, Eloquent JavaScript. Um, yeah. So we have two functions here. The first function, um, we have two functions. The first is our full function. Then the second one, is a function and we want to function contains two things which is um, a text displayed which is hello from foo and the bar function um, and now the bar function now is also a text like hello from bar so which one is run first so when you run when you invoke this foo it comes here it runs the first text hello from foo which is what you can see here and then runs the second one, which is actually, I think now this is what is a callback function because it's used in another function. So it goes, calls this function, uh, looks for instructions, which are just print hello from bar. Uh, I have a small definition here that just allow me to read uh, it aloud. In this example, when the full function is called or invoked, uh, it's added to the top of the call stack. So the JavaScript engine then started executing the code in full, uh, as I've explained, which logs hello from full to the console, right? So the first part, and then calls the bar function. The bar function is then added to the top of the call stack, and its, and it's code is executed, logging hello from bar to the console. So once um, the bar function is done, it is removed from call stack and the engine returns to full to finish executing its code. And finally, when full uh, and the program can be made. I feel like, I feel like this is mean that this has to be like, when we invoke full, we just print the first statement and then we go just run the second function. I don't know. I feel like this is just very complex, but um, 
I hope you get it. The, I hope I, I, I get it the way it's intended to. Uh, I think. It is, the point it is getting across, at least I do understand. Then here's uh, a second example. Uh, here. Can you hear me? We are getting a little bit of lag from your end. Yes. Oh, okay, sorry, I, I wanted to make a, a quick comment, sorry. Uh, in the notes that you had shared, uh, we saw something similar to what happens in Shiny. That is when you define your full function and you execute the, well, the third line that is you invoke the bar function. Uh, I think that in that case, for example, if that were some R code, we would get an error in line three because the bar function has, has not been defined still, but on a later on line. Uh, and that is similar to what happens in Shiny, right? Um, and something I, I, want, I also wanted to say is what you mentioned about, about callbacks. I think, sorry, no, uh, about call stacks or callbacks, I remember. Uh, but you said that they were useful uh, in the case of nested functions. Uh, and well, maybe yes, but also an, an important aspect or why, because or why callbacks can be so useful in JavaScript is due to this concept over here. Let me share the link in the chat about mm -hmm. asynchronous execution. So I am sending the link right now. Uh, and, and it's mainly this idea that the, the execution of your, of your program is not limited to only one operation at a time, but maybe you are performing some operation that takes a lot of time, but between those steps, you are also performing other types of operations. So you are still, sorry, the, the well, in this case, a browser that it is executing JavaScript, it is, it is still listening for events that trigger callbacks. That is something like if the user clicked in some input, then perform some action, even if there is still some long procedure that it is taking place, something like, I am not reading a long JSON file or something. So basically like doing things in parallel, something like that. So that's also uh, why callbacks can be too useful. Okay, thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, okay. Um, yeah, so... I was explaining the second example. So we are invoking the buzz function, but the buzz function utilizes the bar function and the bar function utilizes the foo. So when you run this, this part is run, the bar function is invoked. When the bar function is invoked, the foo function is run and the output from, <laughs> sorry, the output from the foo function is something went wrong, an error stating that something went wrong in foo. Um, once um, John merges this, um, my work with the main, you can read some of these notes that we, that we have. I just want to move ahead because of time. And then again, so this is the example that we have in the book. Um, combine a function that trims blanks of the start and end of string and another function that uses a regular expression to replace spaces with dots. Two functions, combine them. The first one, string blank of the start and end of string, and another function uh, that uses a regular expression to replace spaces with dots. I have two methods here, and it's the same thing, but as in this method I'm calling simpler, maybe I should change the name, is um, remember what I said initially, there, there are many situations where things have been compounded and it's not easy for me, let me speak for myself, it's not easy for me to quickly understand what's going on. So I created the same function, um, but expounded some things. 
So we have two functions. The first one, again, these are arrow functions. Um, the first one, um, it takes the text. Um, I think these are methods. Methods are the way you call methods, the way you use methods in JS is you take your text or whatever it is, in this case, text is an argument, and then dot the method, so dot trim. So this is the first the function name here is trim. So the trim function takes the text and trims it, that is removes the spaces. And then the dot function takes the text and then it replaces all the spaces with dots. So those are the two functions that we want. But the idea here is to combine the and it has to be sequential. So here we are doing some, then doing something else. So, and then um, another function that this is dot. So now um, we have this one function that we are calling pipeline, which takes in the text, the original text, uh, text as argument. So the first thing it will do, it will um, run the trim function. It will run the trim function, which will remove the spaces. <clears throat> and then store it in a variable called trimmed, and then take that trimmed function and then apply the dot function, which will replace all the white spaces with dot and call give that the variable name dotted, and then it returns dotted. So that's our function. That's what we need. So here to test our function, we generate a variable called original, which is an example of a text we want, it has leading spaces, has trailing spaces. Uh, so at first those spaces will be removed and then these white spaces will be replaced with dots. So our, <clears throat> our function is pipeline. It takes in text as an argument. So pipeline original, then the result of that is placed in a variable called trim, then dot. And then now we are just displaying that. So this is the result. Now, this is the same in the book. They've defined these two JS, uh, so uh, these two functions, yes. We have the original text here, but the only difference here is that now the pipeline function is has now taken up everything. Like it has the text, which is our initial text, and then it takes the argument, the first function as an argument, and the second function as an argument. Um, so it takes our text, which in this case is the original text, applies the first function. Remember, as much as this, our function, um, you'll, let us, you'll let us see that our first function is trim. Um, as much as it's been written as first, like just, a, just the name first, it's actually a function and we know it's our function. So it takes initial, the original text, applies the first function, which will be trim, and then the results of that, it applies the second function, then it returns um, the output. So again, uh, pipe, so when you're calling the function, original is the original text. Trim acts as the first function. Remember, as much as it's a function, we are not using parentheses here. We're just going to use the name as it is. Um, and then after that, uh, the dot function and then call the result. So this was really confusing to me as far, um, especially this part here, until I first did it sequentially, like I broke down the pipeline function into these 
two parts. Um, and then that's when I later came to understand what was going on. Yeah. And again, um, I feel like this is the industry standard when you have callbacks. Because again, my understanding of callbacks yeah, it means that trim and dot are the callbacks. Why? Because they've been used in another function, in this case, the pipeline function. Um, so yeah, that, that's how I, I understand callbacks um yeah yeah so and then that was example three and then we move to the anonymous functions which are just functions that don't have the name associated with like normally we use the word function the keyword function uh to just define a function but then in an anonymous in an anonymous function uh we use the function word the function name. Uh, um, I didn't possible a creation the creation only be as, as a value. Oh, I think I get an anonymous. Oh, I think when you store, if you're going to see it in an example. If you store this anonymous function in a variable, you can you can access it later. Oh, this is not easy. So the first example um, just prints a message to the console. Um, this function is stored in the Greek variable. Then you can call it by invoking Greek then parentheses. And for me. I think the reason this doesn't um, is an anonymous function is because it doesn't have a name here. If we go back to um, this, the function declaration, which is like function, then add, so in our case here, yes, the function doesn't and then take a name. We are giving that function, which I think shouldn't be confused with the name. So, concrete, when you call create, you get welcome to JS or JS Club. Another example is um, we pass arguments. We can pass arguments. So, the first one didn't have arguments. We could just call in the, um, we're just printing a message. The second one has arguments. We pass arguments to the anonymous function. So for example, yeah, we want to uh, print a message based on the platform. So it can be welcome to r for gs welcome to, uh, I don't know which, uh, which other community is this, but like we can use here. But um, yeah, the difference between of example one and example two is just that here we have arguments. And then um, example three is the self-executing function, which is um, just a function. Another use case of anonymous functions is to invoke the function immediately after initialization. That is what a self-executing function is. Um, and I know this happens in R. There's a way you can have, let's say, X is equal to, uh, let me see if I can, let me see if I can access our studio. So there's a way we can say X is equal to four, and then we just drop this around. Yeah, we get the result um, directly. So I think it's something like that. And then now because it's a function, it has to have trailing. Uh, parentheses at the end, and that means if we had an argument at this point, uh, let's say there was an argument of platform, like in example two, that argument would argument would have come here. Let me actually just try this. So just give me. Let me try. Yeah. Uh, anonymous command right here. Are we still together? Sorry if I'm rambling. Yep, still here. 
Okay, so yeah. let me try control. Arthur, thank you very much for encouraging me to <laughs> give to the so as much as mine is white, <laughs> like the same is white. Um, so let's say we wanted um, welcome to the GS for the uh, book club. Then we had something like, uh, I don't know, anything. Um, then let's say we are adding whatever. Control, enter. Yeah, yeah. So once we add an argument here, um, that argument shall come inside. Cool. Um, and then functional programming, uh, just a way, a tool of programming in which data, yes? The brutal the Sorry? Sorry, hello? Uh, Lucio, you're saying something. Uh, Peter was saying something, but I, I don't know. Maybe oh, it was have... a problem with Zoom. Is you need us... text on chat? Oh, okay. Um, okay. So functional programming. Uh, it's just it's a style of programming in which data is transformed through successive application of functions rather than using control structures such as loops. Um, I remember when PAR came out, because PAR is functional programming, I, I was so used to using loops. I used loops a lot, because that was how, like, that was what we were doing before PAR came out, which is in R. Um, and when PAR came out, uh, I had a bit of issues um, trying to understand it, but I later got the hang of it. Uh, but I still find myself using follow up here and there. So functional programming is just uh, it's, it's a good way. It's a good way to write code that is just clear to understand and um, bug resistant. And JavaScript uh, arrays provide several methods to support functional programming. The first one array dot like the like the letter as uh, the word it should be the dot itself but if I put that in our markdown something was failing so I think I should put this into brackets array dot the actual dot sum but uh, what this does it returns true if any element in an array passes a test so let's say we have a uh, array of that contains four things. All of them are strings. So here we have four strings. And then we want to test whether each of the elements of our array has a length greater than three. So we want to test whether each of the array, uh, which each of the, whether we have some elements in the array that have a length greater than three. So what we do, this is the function, again, arrow function, which takes X as an argument. In our case, X will be each of the elements. And then it returns the length of each element, or rather it checks the length of each element and then um, checks, or rather checks whether the length of each element is greater than three. If it is, it returns true. If not, it returns false, I think. And then wrapping that into dot sum checks whether there is at least one true in that. And I think I want to try this, but again, let me try and explain. We have an array with four elements. Now we want to check whether there is at least one element in the array or there are some elements in the array that have length greater than three. Now, since this is a string or in, I think in any object in JavaScript, for you to check the length, you just say x dot length. So here, 
we don't want to check the length of the whole array because if we did data dot length it will give us four we want to check the length of each element so the first one will be four the second one will be two please please pause please mute rather Someone mute Peter. Yeah, please mute. Um, okay. Uh, luckily, Pyre has the same function. Nice that lots of my mental model of R will transfer someone. You're welcome, Asha. You're welcome. Um, that's why I started saying that um, it's very good to relate what we already know with what we have um, in JS. So yeah, so it checks the length of E, it checks this function checks whether each element has a length greater than three. So this will be true. This will be false. This will be false and this will be true. So that is only that part over there. And then now dot sum, data because our array is called data data dot sum now check do we have some truths in that output do we have some elements that have a length greater than three in our array and so it returns the string some longer than three then rev which is the result of that which is true so if i take this control c let uh, let me just yeah where are we where are we where are we um we're here I read it. um let's let's test this so um I want to see what is returned by this part here um control C uh con con my phone short the time oops what's the time um or oh, 42 I, we are actually almost we are nearing the end so control z um have i have i expressed this the right way it doesn't look like i have does it Doesn't look like it's right. Right. Yeah. What is missing initializer? Um, um mm, oh, oh, okay, okay. So let's take the first one. Let's take um wait no, my function. Um, let's take the first value. So <laughs> let me first run this before I start it. Uh, I, I think you're getting an error because in line Sorry? 254, you are defining data with a const declaration, but then you are reassigning data. Oh, yeah. So yes. no, it's... Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. So I think, let's see. Let's see. Control enter. Okay, still missing initial. What am I doing? This is my data, right? If I print, let's say console log this, it brings the first element. You have to always remember that um, JS is zero index. Yeah. So this should bring this. Oops. Control enter this. Okay. So that works. So now I'm defining my function. Let me see. The arrow function, the method, the third method, the second method. Okay, let me just copy the sake of time. Um, we are yeah, here. So, so we want to my function. 
Ah, is equal to oh, that is what we were missing. And then console.log um data two zero. We just want to check. So I have to run. If it doesn't work, I'm just going to go back to our notes. So what are we doing? We have our array. We're defining a function that checks the length of an item. So for us, we wanted to check the length of the first element, which will be true. So it doesn't trick it doesn't return true. You're not invoking the function in the console.log. You're just um, uh, yeah, printing the data point. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um control enter. Should be true. Yes. True. Why? Because our first value, our first element is has length greater than three. Okay, yeah. So my explanation was right. So two, oops, two will Two is a zero one two. It will bring false. Yes. So yeah. So this check um it check that the length of each element is greater than and then and now the wrapper which is dot sum check so that we have at least sum. Yeah. So this is three um the same as before but then here it checks whether all like every element is uh has a length greater than one this i changed uh, a bit so this is true 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 again the same explanation as before uh oh this should be every it shouldn't be some sorry this should be uh, this should be every at that point. Yeah. Oops, I'm not even saved. Okay. And then there is, there is, there is Google. Yeah. So that should be every. And then filter. Again, the same concept. We only want to get those elements that have a length greater than three. Um, and you can you can relate this to because if I was if I was given such a question, create a new array containing only values that pass a test. For me, my very first instinct is a whole loop. For like if it was in R, like for I in one up to the length of data, um, check it this is. and then map um, this it creates a new array by calling a function for each element of an existing um, array. So in this case, the same array applies. What we want, we want for each element, we want to slice, that is we want to extract the first two. Um, slice zero, two means from the first to the, to the, to the, to the, to the item that occupies the second index, but exclusive. Like when we say slice zero two, I will take the first and the second. I wouldn't take the third. I remember doing that. So in this case, for this we want zero, one. We won't take two because slice has argument. It has arguments, and if you have two arguments, the second argument is exclusive. So it's from the start to what occupies the second index, but exclusive. So that will be th. This will be IS, this will just be A, and this will be TE. I hope that um, is understandable. This is what I've struggled with today. <laughs> and um, I'm happy, I think I, I've reached a point where I think I've understood it. Um, array dot reduce, it reduces an array to a single value using some combining function and a starting value. Uh, the combining function must take two values, which are the current running total and the next value of the array. 
if the array is empty, array dot reduce returns the starting value. Then now this is the syntax which will act as our example one. Um, and this is an example. I'm not. I don't know if I've used the example we have in the book. I think I have it somewhere, uh, but it's not our first example. Yeah, we have it, but it's not our first example. Um, so what's going on here? We want to take an array of numbers, uh, an array of items, and we want to do something with that array to return something like a unison, like accumulation or a concatenated um, string or something. So for this to work, for reduce to work, it has to take a few elements. And the first one is the callback function. And the callback, a callback function is here will be a function to execute for each element in the array. A function to execute for each element in the array. And its return value becomes the value of the accumulator parameter on the next invocation. What does that mean? We have this function here that takes two arguments. I'll explain what these two arguments are in a minute. But it takes these two arguments, increments or adds them in, in this case because we are we are taking we are calculating the sum we are we are taking the sum of this we want to generate the sum of this array so it takes these two arguments but i'll explain what they are adds them and then the result of this becomes the new total you know like i is equal to i plus one and then now it becomes the new i up there um that is the call bank function you have to remember it's a function that does something for us, we are summing these numbers and we want to do to do, like sum them cumulatively. So the first one will be one, then the next time it's going to be one plus two, then then that becomes three, the next time three plus three, it becomes six, the next time six plus four, and so on. So that's the callback function. And the callback function itself contains um and and why is it a callback function? Because it's been used in a reduced function. That's how I interpreted it. And why is it um what makes up this function? The call bank the call bank function has the following argument: the accumulator, which is the value resulting from the previous call to the callback function. Um, on the first call, the initial value is specified. Otherwise, it becomes the first value of the array. Now, this is where we are going to initiate our accumulator. Our accumulator right now is total. That is going to be our accumulator. And our initial value of the accumulator is going to be zero. And then the current value, that is the value of the current element. On the first call, that means when the when the when the function is run the first time, the value of the first element, which is um index zero, on the first call, the value of the first element, if an initial value was specified, otherwise the value of the second element. I'm not sure that. I'm not sure about that. But we've already initiated our value. And then the index position of current value in the array. Uh, I don't know how clear that is applying in our case. But this number, this number here will stand for like each of the elements in our array. So the first time our, and then this initial value is the initial value of total. So the first time total will, uh, total will be zero and number will be one. We have zero plus one, we get one. Total becomes one. Then we go to number, which is the second one, two. So one plus two becomes three. Total becomes three. You get the idea, I hope you get. Um, so just always remember that this result here becomes the new accumulator, becomes the new total in our case. Um, and in, when you initiate a value, that becomes the first total. And then so now this reduce function, we have to specify the array. We specify the callback function, which I have already, oops, that's the same, gosh, five more minutes, which I have already specified. And then the initial value, and then now we come here and 
um, call the return, the reduced function. Now, the reduced um, reduce function has to, it will have to, uh, what do I call them? Parameters, yeah, argument. The callback function, the callback function in our case, which is summation and the initial value of the accumulator. So once you do that, when you run console.log sum, it gives you 15. Again, why? Because you specify the initial is zero, that becomes the initial total. Then the initial number becomes the initial value here. So zero plus one, one. One becomes the new total, number goes to two. One plus two, three. Three becomes the new total, number goes to the next one, like that, like that. Um, because of time, I'm going to rush to another example. So we have another example here, which is not the example in the book. This example, we want to, oh, sorry, I didn't write the, whatever we are doing. Uh, oh, where's the instruction? Uh, uh, this scenario, blah, blah, blah. The combining function must take two values. Blah, blah, blah. Uh, an example will make it clear. To start, let's create an acronym. We are creating an acronym using a loop. Here we are creating an acronym using a loop. And I, I used the answer. I used the, the final answer to understand what's going on. So when you look at this, TIAT, which is the acronym, it's just, we are just taking the first element of, we're just taking the first item the first element of each item or the first item of each element, uh, whichever one. So when you come here, um, what we are doing is we'll have a, an accumulator with an initial value of nothing, blank, like nothing. It's not a space, it's just blank. So that becomes our first accumulator. And then next value, so this represents each and every element here but we only want the first item in each element. That is the first letter because now we are dealing with strings. So the first one will be nothing plus T, that becomes T, T becomes the new accumulator, then T plus the second one, which is I, and in JS, when you plus two strings, you're just concatenating them, which becomes now T, T, I, TI becomes the new accumulator, goes to the other one, A, you get TI plus A becomes TIA, and then finally TIA plus the first element, which is T for test, becomes TIAT. So again, like before, you define your array, you define your callback function, which is the same as like what you wanted to do. It depends on the question. Here, we are creating an acronym. We want to extract the first element of each, and then we concatenate. So there'll be an idea of adding. Um, and then the return value, which is what the reduce function does. The reduce function takes two arguments. The first one is our callback function, and the second one is the initial value of the accumulator in the callback function. And then we later print the acronym. Um, it's 6.59, one minute, the same as this. Um, we want to print out, sorry, I didn't check the instructions. Hello world. Uh, so again, four things. The first one, array. The second one, the function. The third one, the initial value. The fourth one, the return value, which is what is produced by reduce. Reduce takes two arguments. The first one, callback function. The second one, the initial value of the accumulator. In our case here, the accumulator is total. Um, we just want to form word hello world from an exclamation mark from this. So is the first in initial value is nothing. Nothing, it goes, it appends itself here. String becomes the first item. So nothing hello becomes hello. Hello becomes the new total. String becomes the second item and so on and so on until you get hello world. The last concept was closures. I didn't understand closures, so we have nothing at this point. Uh, if anyone would want to add, pull my work and add, uh, whatever, 
information about closures, I will, I will appreciate, but it's because I spent too much time on these others. Maybe if I sat down and really read about closure, maybe I'm going to understand. And gentlemen, that was my presentation for the day. Thank thanks you. so much, um, Yes, thank you, Chef. Thank also, thank you for yeah, reading so you. much. Sorry? Uh, you provide, sorry for adding so much. I saw you provided uh, content. No, no, I no, said, no, no, no. Yeah, from, I think you said from Mozilla. You added sorry, a little I can't bit hear. Of... Sorry, what? I can't hear you well. There's... um. I can't hear you well. I don't know whether it's from my side, um, but the reason I added more content that is not in the book is because as I was telling you before, uh, his nice, another nice compact treatment of callback functions. Oh, thank you. Oh. Yeah, I also didn't get, uh, what was the use of closures? Uh, uh, from I was from what I was searching, uh, there seems to be a uh, an analog in object oriented programming for closures. But mm. uh, I I don't know if, if someone uh, Arthur, did you understand the concept? So I I, I was a bit confused by the clo closures to be honest with you because when I was reading the closures section, it sounded to me like uh what what would be in um R I guess a function factory. Um, so it's basically like a function that creates functions that at least that was my understanding of it. Um, the closures, mm -hmm. the closures in R seem like they're, they're something different, uh, where you basically have kind of an expression and, and an environment in which to evaluate the expression, uh, from, from, from memory. Um, yeah, in, in short, I'm not sure I fully understood, but I, I, I I think I had like a very different understanding. Maybe this term closure has different meanings in different programming languages, but but again, like the the content seemed a lot like um, a lot like I guess what an R would be called function factory. So functions that would create other functions. Did you what did what did you get from that, uh, Lucia? Uh, well, what I got from that is that well, again, you can define a function is either function, but that the main point was that for this nested function that you're defining, you can give it parameters or or, or variables that are used in a in a parentheses book. Maybe I should share my screen to to show. No, 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 no. I don't have time. Um, I uh, don't have time. I'm sorry. It's it's seven or three p.m. in Kenya. Um. I, I okay, need to okay. drop for I, I think you you guys can continue. I think I can just drop and you continue. I think they'll still record this so I can catch up. But thank you so much for staying till the end. I hope you've learned something. Um yeah, JS is scary. Like we're only in chapter three and I'm so tired. <laughs> um, but um I'll try and soldier on till till the end. I felt like this chapter, yeah, so, I, I, I don't know how others felt, but I felt like this chapter was kind of confusing in, in, in the sense that I, you know, it's about, ostensibly it's about callback functions, but I feel like it was never really clearly defined within the chapter what a callback function is and how it's used. Um, I guess the W3 schools yeah. link I, I, I gave is, seems like it's a, gets to the point a lot more, a lot more directly. This, I mean, the, the chapter was interesting because it was, at least mm -hmm. by my reading was a lot more about, um, I guess, functions and functional programming um, in, in, in JavaScript, which is really, yeah. which is really interesting. Uh, but I, I'm, yeah. I'm still not sure I've fully gotten callbacks, yeah. to, 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 to be honest. Uh, I mean, yeah. maybe Lucio, maybe you have a clear understanding of what callbacks are, or, or um, you know, whether mm -hmm. now or, you know, like kind of offline, you could maybe, maybe kind of, you know, provide us a little bit more 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 details on, on on how callbacks are are used i mean i guess like there's synchronous callbacks and they're asynchronous callbacks right i guess and mm -hmm. I, my understanding of like a callback is basically it's a callback function is a function that 
that has another function as one of its arguments. Um, and then I guess the synchronous or asynchronous is just like when when the function's executed. Does so, it wait wait for so some other see, action or does it get executed immediately? So you see, Asa, my question here is which one becomes the callback? Is it the function inside or it's the function outside? Because what I understand is the function, the function, a function that contains another function. Is that the callback, or is it the function that is contained in another function? Um, anyway, so, so I think I think it's time? the function that's an argument of another function. So that that first function, yeah. I guess they might like we might call it like an outer function. I think that's the callback function. That's that's the way I at least that's the way I understand it, which could be exactly wrong. I don't know, but anyway, thank you guys. Um, we have to go. Please, Asa, Peter, please pick a topic you want to um present on the google sheet we are off for the next two months a uh, week yay um so our next class is on 30th of march um and we don't have someone working on that so hi asa <laughs> how are you you can take that for me i don't know no pressure Sure, sure. Yeah, no, I'll definitely, then, I'll definitely claim some, some things here. Uh, but you and Lucio got the good ones. <laughs> <laughs> and the Lucio, especially Lucio, got all the good ones. I'm like, okay, he was too fast, but that's okay. It's okay um, if you want to overwrite my selection. It's okay. I just no, did it. No no no. no, no, not at all. Not at all. Not okay. at all. No, I, I, I'm, I'm happy. Actually, I think I'll probably take objects and. Yeah, classes because it feels it like it's uh, sort of introductory stuff that I could probably handle. Uh, I'll just write my name in for that now, and uh, and and then yeah, um, you guys, you guys who who know who know more about uh, front end stuff are probably better situated than me to <laughs> take take the rest. Yeah. Okay, I'll drop now. Thank you so much. Talk to you soon. Bye. Thanks Bye again, Shell. Okay, so Arthur, about what you mentioned about callbacks. Uh -huh. Yeah, I, I was reading right now, and I think I, I got a little bit confused about what the callback is, because uh, about the part that they mentioned that it, it is supposed to be an, an instruction for a, sorry, a set of instructions for later use. Uh, for me, that the games, sorry, that comes quite clear when you are using event-oriented programming in JavaScript. So basically, when you are using event listeners, uh, okay. uh, but yeah, the, the examples in this part, I mean, they, they, these callbacks, they simply look like functions. I think that when you use these callbacks in an event approach, then it is a little bit more clear why is it useful. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Well, I mean, at least now after kind of, well, looking, you know, watching Shell's presentation and talking with you guys, I think I, ha I, think I have a clear understanding of, of of, of what this works, but it, again, you know, maybe it's just me as a reader, but I, I was really confused by this chapter. I mean, the contents were very interesting, but I didn't, I didn't quite get the link with callbacks. I was kind of frustrated by that. Um, but yeah, uh, no, I think for uh, for for this book, at least for me, who's who's not coming to this with a much of a much of a web dev background, I think I'll probably like Shell be looking at like W three schools and the Mozilla Docs uh, to fill in to fill in some of the gaps because uh, they offer they offer a lot more a lot more detail than this 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 book can at least for the initial start yeah oh and okay the elephant JavaScript yeah I was I had that one open I'll have to look at that one too yeah I feel that that one also goes quite in depth so it's been useful awesome awesome I'll have that I'll I'll give that one a look thank you so much Lucio. Okay, thank you. Bye. All right, bye-bye.